One of my favorite artifacts out here in the shop is a trolling reel. <laughs> I'm not much of a troller, but this one's special because it belonged to the late, great Charlie Bird. Now, if you know anything about jazz guitar or jazz music in general, you probably know something about Charlie because he was a very influential jazz guitarist back in the middle part of the 20th century. His record, Jazz Samba, introduced Brazilian music to the jazz music world in this country. Uh, in fact, he played on over 100 records during his career. He lived right over across the bay here in Annapolis, Maryland. And uh, his wife, Becky Bird, stopped by and gave me uh, some stuff that Charlie had owned that was fishing related, including registration to his sailboat, 1972. Charlie's sailboat's name was I'm Hip. <laughs> it's a good name for a jazz musician sailboat, isn't it? And, uh, and he liked to go out and troll on that sailboat. And I like to imagine him trolling uh, for rockfish underneath the Bay Bridge from Annapolis, Maryland, on his way up to Rock Hall, Maryland, where he played frequently at a little club called the Mainstay. Now, the Mainstay is still there to this day. So if you ever get over to Rock Hall and you want to hear some good music, I'd encourage you to stop in there and see who's playing, because I bet it's going to be some pretty good musicians. But this episode isn't about music, and it's not even about Charlie Bird, although we could talk about that for a long time but this is about a concept that Charlie knew a little something about and that is creativity creativity and fishing they kind of go hand in hand don't they <laughs> welcome to the shop folks this is the episode where we just sit out here in the shop talk about stuff I've collected over the years and I, I'm not an expert about anything but I do like to learn as much as I can about the stuff that I've held on to uh, some of it valuable and some of it not very valuable most of it not very valuable but it means something to me anyway uh, so this week I've been thinking a lot about this creativity concept so, so do this think about the best anglers you know in fact, think about two or three of the best anglers you know. And now think about something that they all have in common. One of the things that I've noticed is that these folks usually have a hobby or something that they do. It might be something they do professionally. It might be their job. But most of the time it's not. But they have a creative outlet of some kind. Uh, and, and that creative outlet may or may not be related to fishing, and a lot of times it's not. Uh, for example, I know some amazing musicians, I know some painters and some photographers and a lot of different uh, artists uh, who are also amazing musicians. It kind of goes hand in hand. If you've read any of my books or come to some of my talks, you might have heard me say this. It's the bad days and make us better fishermen. Because you know on the good days, when the fish are just jumping in the boat, you don't have to do a whole lot. You just cast out and reel them in and everything happens you know, just like you think it's going to. Uh, and you don't learn much. You might catch a lot of fish and have fun, but you don't learn a whole lot. But it's on those bad days when the fish aren't biting, what do you do? Well, you start rooting around in the bottom of your tackle box. Uh, maybe you start modifying your lures a little bit. Well, for sure, you go over and fish that area you hadn't fished before. Maybe there's a creek coming out you always wanted to try or a point that you wanted to check the drop off on. Uh, and so you check that out, and before you know it, you're catching fish again, and you've learned something because you've tapped into your imagination and to your creativity. And it's the bad days that make us better fishermen overall. Now, not to say that we look forward to the bad days. I don't uh, necessarily, but it, they do help us. So I'm fortunate enough to ha to work around some pretty smart people. I work for George Washington University in Washington, D.C., and uh, work with a lot of scientists, including some neuroscientists. And so I've been quizzing them a little bit about this creativity thing because I'm curious about how the brain works and what makes us creative. And, you know, for years there's been this concept of right brain, left brain, and the thought is that your left brain is the mechanical side, and that's what causes you to do all the practical stuff and math problems and stuff like that. But the right side is more artistic, and where your music and your writing and all that comes from. Well, it turns out there's not a whole lot of truth to that. Uh, the whole brain uh, works toward our creativity, but it's a constant background current that's always communicating back and forth across all regions of our brain. It's our imagination. And if you just sit around and do nothing, 
it's a lot easier to tap into the imagination, but a lot of us don't have time to do that. We got other things, you know, that's going on. But it's important, I think, to tap into that imagination. Now, up to this point in this series, we've talked about a lot of innovative gear. We've talked about lures, we've talked about rods and reels and tackle and uh, and electronics, and, and we'll talk about a lot more stuff. But the one thing that all of those things have in common is that someone, somewhere along the line, had the creativity to be innovative to create that particular lure or that particular piece of gear, and it became iconic. It became a part of the vernacular. It became part of what makes us all better fishermen. And so, how do we get to that? I mean, we don't want to lose that as a human race for certain. And I don't think we ever will because, you know, creativity just kind of comes naturally to some of us. Now, there is such a thing as natural talent. And, I, and I've been fortunate. I have some very talented uh, kids who are musicians and who, who are just amazing at what they do. Uh, and, and maybe you know people like that, too, that are just a, absolutely good naturally at something and that happens uh and uh, but but that's not necessarily what i'm talking about you don't have to be naturally good to be a good fisherman you don't have to be naturally good to be creative it helps but you can still be good i, I fortunately fished around some uh some little kids in the past uh who i just recognized immediately that they were going to be good fishermen. And I've enjoyed watching some of these kids grow up. There's one little girl, uh, she was Korean, and oh my goodness, she never fished before in her life till she got in my boat, picked up a fishing rod like she'd held it all her life. She picked up snap jigging on her second cast, and she was catching more fish than anybody there. She was four years old. <laughs> and and so that kind of natural talent, she's not an adult yet. When she gets to be adult, I can't wait to see what kind of fisherman she turns out to be. She's going to be amazing, I bet. But uh, but it's that not that kind of natural talent. We all need to figure out how to tap into that creativity, right? We need to try to get better at it. So let me show you a few things. So I, as I stroll around the, the shop here, I see some things that uh, have been created by some of my fellow anglers who are filmmakers, photographers, graphic artists, drawers, musicians, boat builders, painters, uh, lure makers, especially lure makers, even some, uh, even some fashion designers. <laughs> and, uh, and I like to hold on to like the first thing those people give me if they give me something. And some people have been nice enough to, to give me things along the line. And I figure when they give me stuff, they're probably going to give me something that's been, you know, they worked pretty hard on. Uh, and so I'll, if they give me two or three lures, I'll, I'll use one or two of them, but I'm going to save one or two, uh, because you never know when that next lefty cray is going to be out there. Uh, who's going to come up with some uh, some kind of innovative design uh, that's going to be uh, you know an amazing thing, uh, and uh, and I've also been fortunate to know uh, some really amazing anglers uh, over the years who have also been artists, uh, and I'll show you a few things, and I could do an episode, a shop series episode on all these things. Uh, for example, there's a card of doll flies. I've got several of those given to me by Elmer Doll Thompson, who was an East Tennessee uh, fly maker, and uh, his innovative idea was to make flies out of polar bear fur. <laughs> well, it turns out polar bear fur is one of the most refractive substances known to man especially for fly tying and it, it works great and it caught fish uh and uh, here's here's another uh card of lures that i like walt carries poppers waltz the famous waltz poppers uh it walt perfected the art of making bluegill flies and uh, not just for bluegill you can fish for anything with them but they're especially good for pan fish uh from virginia and uh and it was an amazing and influential fly tire speaking of fly tires there's a, a lure tied by ed shink tort Creek Hopper. <laughs> uh, Ed was from Pennsylvania, and uh, and he was also innovative. And his his uh, innovation came in some using simple materials and making simple flies, uh, but making them well so that they would catch fish. <laughs> and I, I get some other stuff over here. I got to show you this. So here's a card. I mean, a, a box full 
of Joe Yak's Mac Whackers. Now, Joe gave me those uh, before he passed on, and uh, and they were fish catchers, and they mean a little something to me because, you know, Joe was a good fisherman, and he's also extremely innovative. And, and before I quit, I got to show you, uh, well, here's some books, some flies up here, some more flies, and Lefty's Deceiver by Lefty Cray. <laughs> now, I'm going to do some uh, more talking about Lefty Cray in the future, but uh, there's no denying that Lefty was one of the most influential fi fishermen uh, ever, uh, especially in the world of fly fishing. Uh, and he came up with some innovative designs and he wrote a lot of good books. He was an inspirational person. And I've noticed that creative people like to surround themselves with other creative people. Uh, and there's a se several different reasons for that. One is because that uh, when you're around other creative people, you might pick up some advice, but th it's just that creativity is catching. You know, we're able to tap in to that undercurrent, that background activity of imagination when we're around other people who are just as imaginative. Uh, so there's something to be said for that. So I'm kind of going on and on here, but I just wanted to encourage you to try to tap in to that part of your brain that makes you creative. And I asked some of these neuroscientists, I said, well, what's the best way to do that? And they said, do nothing. They said, the best thing you can do is just get out and go for a long walk or just be outside for a long time or do do something repetitive, something you don't have to think about too hard. And when I think about all those things, you know what I come to? Fishing. <laughs> because that incorporates all of those things. And when I'm fishing, it takes my mind away from everything else. And I can be imaginative. I can tap into that Im imagination layer uh, that's always going on. And I bet you can too. So I'd encourage you to try to do that. And thank you for tuning in to the shop series this time, folks. And next time we'll drag out some more fishing equipment or vintage lures or, or something and talk about it. Uh, but this time I thought it'd be fun to kind of do a deep dive into this imagination thing and see where that takes us. So I hope you'll uh, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. And now your likes and shares are very much appreciated. And I'll talk to you next week. Get out there and go fishing if you get a chance.